Winston and this video is part of the series we're putting together for our course on Internet Evangelism and Mobile Ministry at City Vision College. And I've got my very, I shouldn't say a very old friend because he's not very old, he's my age, uh, but we went to university together many years ago, uh, Tony O'Hagan. He's doing work with Campus Crusade now but he's had quite an academic career since then. Uh, and I'll let him tell you about himself and how the Lord's drawn him uh, into the work of Internet Evangelism. Oh, hi. Um, uh, it's just been introduced. My name is Tony, Tony O'Hagan, and I live uh, in uh, Brisbane in Australia. And um, I guess many, many years ago, uh, I just visited high school and I got to university and uh, looked at the university campus that I was at and I thought, my goodness, look at all the different sorts of people that God has brought to this place and what an opportunity to share my faith uh, here. It was like I could see the, 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 the university as a mission field. And uh, in my first year at university, we, uh, we didn't actually have um, very much going on in terms of evangelism, but a group of mine, a group of friends of mine got together and we uh, ran a little event and saw one guy get saved. And the next year, um, we had a guy called Richard Thackeray come and meet with us as a group and start the first student life group, which is part of Camps Crusade for Christ in, in Queensland, in my state. So it's the first group in my state. And a group of about five of us and then grew and to about 200 by the time I finished. Uh, in our first year, we actually uh, had invited Billy Graham out to speak uh, to the local churches. And uh, we thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could get him to speak? Actually, he didn't come. He was sick and he sent his associate Leighton forward. Uh, but we did see uh, about 2,000 university students turn up to uh, uh, a presentation by Leighton Ford in, in my year and we were a big part of you know, advertising all that and promoting it and, and just believing in faith that God would do it. So I guess in my first early years I kind of got a vision for what God can do if we really trust him. It's like, kind of like a never say can't attitude and I guess that's kind of rubbed off a bit on me over the years and, and uh, it, throughout my year, university years I, I enjoyed uh, about four years at my degree I went on to uh, work for the government for about three years and then I came back to the University of Queensland, uh, worked as, as a systems programmer, um, did a bit, of, little bit of tinkering in research. I actually went off to England at one time to get trained and then, um, then I actually kind of uh, went to another university and I, and I actually taught there for three years at Queensland University of Technology and then, uh, then I went back to industry and for many years I actually worked as a software engineer working, working in many different commercial projects, uh, telecommunications, health. Um, uh, transport, I've done a lot of things. So all kinds of uh, different industry projects um, and through that time uh, we've seen some very exciting things to, to work on. We've, we've won industry awards and, and uh, seen amazing things got built. But at about 2004 I, I put a little stop on my, my career and thought, hmm, well, what was all that for? <laughs> uh, it was a lot of fun, learnt lots of things. Um, but uh, what was God's plan in all that? You know, why, why was I doing all that? And I scratched my head and I thought, how? Oh, wouldn't it be amazing if, if God could actually um, reach people using the internet? So I did a bit of research and I found a guy in the UK called Tony Whitaker, uh, and uh, he uh, sort of runs a, a group that I'm part of, and I'm Australian rep for Internet Evangelism Day, so we sort of promote this across the world. And uh, so that was kind of a stepping stone first for me to realize that the potential of this. And what I realized was that uh, uh, in a sense as a software engineer, I held in my his hands a key and that key could unlock a door of ministry for many people. So I hope during our little chat today, you kind of see how some of that door opening happens. Um, that's for me as a software engineer. Now, of course, there are many different people who are involved in internet ministry and software engineering is just one little piece of it. Um, another huge part is actually, uh, believe it or not, online marketing. So often we have to find and, and promote websites and, and people maybe help people become aware of um, uh, you know, how they can uh, be connected with, with the truth of the gospel. And uh, a large part of that is also um, mobile technology as well, which of course has taken off. Um, and in more recent time, um, uh, about oh, about a couple of jobs ago, I was about to take on a, a, a about to actually leave the university. I'd, I'd actually worked at QUT as I mentioned, but then I actually worked in industry for a long time, and then I actually went back into IT research. So I was actually in, in research for about six years in IT, uh, and and across three different projects, and that sort of 
phase of my life was about to come to an end and I kind of wondered um, you know, where I'd be going next and I sensed a call to go to a conference, a particular conference overseas and saw God provide quite miraculously for some, some funds for me to go um, to, to get to that conference. And that kind of opened my eyes to um, the impact that the gospel was having through internet ministries and satellite and radio as well uh, to, to um, different regions of the world where, where uh, so many people just don't know about God at all. Um, in more recent time, my next, my last career change, I've actually just changed my, I actually work two jobs, by the way, I'm actually a missionary, part-time, uh, and I'm also, I work about a 65-hour week, roughly, pretty busy boy, boy. Uh, about 32 hours of that a week, I, I get paid for it in an IT job, and about one day a week, I'm actually support, supported by people in Cancer Crusade, for Cancer Crusade Ministry, but I actually work, volunteer about another 20 hours on top of that, and uh, and the IT job, I kind of realised uh, that maybe God was calling me to change from just doing plain old IT, but actually to get into mobile technology. And one of the reasons for this was because um, if we look at the world, we can see. Um, if, I can, if I can bring up this little PowerPoint slide, I might just give a give a crack. Uh, just a moment. Now it's got to learn how to do screen sharing on this thing. There we go. So hopefully you can see that. Yep, I can see it. Oh, it's just right. vanished. Back here. Is it working or not? Did I choose the wrong one? Uh, just, do, is it working or not really? It's, it's, it's not working, quite, but when I, I speak have... again, when I speak it comes back to me, so when you speak it, it, it appears again. So you go okay, and speak sorry, and it so, appear. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, uh, okay, so basically this little diagram shows, um, slice, slice up, slices up the world. And it shows that about 30% of the world have uh, internet access, but about 78%, that's the 30% plus 47%, have uh, mobile access. So the potential is there if we can harness mobile, te mobile technology to reach uh, a very large number of people. Um, another little um, picture that I saw presented uh, recently was this one, which I'll just bring to the next one. Uh, which I'm actually, I think you're just seeing my PowerPoint rather than the actual slide of my PowerPoint. So I think it's probably not showing the right way. Okay, well the basic idea is that there are many different technologies that we can use to communicate on the internet. So perhaps if you communicate with someone using Twitter, you don't have a really close connection with someone, but at least they're sort of following a little bit about what you do. Uh, maybe if you have Facebook, you can you know talk directly. You can send email. It's a little bit more personal. Um, if you send an instant message. Um, or if you particularly say if you have a video chat like we're almost doing today, it's you can obviously see much more about, uh, you can see and understand much more of the uh, emotional sense of that person. You can you can see their lips and you can perhaps connect with them a little bit better. And particularly if you're you know doing some kind of media multimedia talking, uh, that has huge potential. Now at the moment I actually work um, in partnership with one uh, large group you'll probably hear about called Global Media Outreach and we actually work with three groups. Uh, we work also a little bit with um, Truth Media in Canada and another group in, in Europe called Top Kretian or Jesus.net and uh, so basically what we do is we c connect with people who, in churches who are interested in be being becoming volunteers by writing emails to people typically and to some more ex extent now we're starting to see uh, uh, we're using other mediums so other the uh, we're sort of walking up the scale here. We're starting to write letters to people, but now we're actually also beginning to engage with them in, in a more visual or verbal way. So one of the visions I had was, how could I actually solve this problem or uh, address this concern that um, we could actually build deeper relationships with people uh, using internet technology? And also, I, I think it's very important that we're not really trying to just get people on the internet and keep them there. We're actually really trying to help them um, begin um, new fellowships, uh, church, or, or or become part of established churches. Uh, so our goal isn't just to do ministry on the internet. Our goal is to actually help them connect with other believers. That's the goal. And so what we wanted to do is build a tool also that would help people uh, be able to transition from one to the other. So perhaps they're used to face-to-face -face ministry, and they could actually assist us in online ministry. So they could perhaps begin a virtual group online, or vice versa. Perhaps they could begin 
uh, with uh, we could perhaps connect with them in a virtual group, but then encourage them to start a face-to-face -face group uh, where they are with the people and friends that, that they meet. And so we wanted to create an environment where those sorts of transitions are possible. So right at the moment, myself and Bob Prouty are uh, looking at developing a new tool to assist us with this sort of um, approach. The other thing we wanted to be able to do was to um, was to also uh, <coughs> uh, use what we thought was the best material uh, for this. So if I just switch my sharing off for a minute. Um, and so we wanted to look at some of the sorts of things that have been used very well for reproducing fellowships. So uh, a lot of people will go along to Bible study and that's great for the group they know and it's a nice time together and obviously you can grow in Christ that way. But we, what, what we were looking for was material that would actually encourage people to specifically um, go and reach their neighbours and uh, go beyond their group and uh, not just to be sort of inward focused but very outward focused. And so um, we've re recently been working with a group called City Teams who uh, they've actually um, uh, started about uh, 17,000 groups, I believe, in about 49 countries. And uh, so we think the material is very effective and we're hoping to incorporate some of that in partnership with them, um, uh, creating a little virtual tool for that. So that sort of brings together a little piece of my history, God sort of planting my heart uh, a longing to see uh, people who are lost, uh, one to him, but also disciple. And, and secondly, uh, my passion and love for technology and uh, seeing that as a way that could unlock a door for, for many other people to, to be in ministry. So that's what we're trying to do, sort of combine those two things together. Okay, I, I'm very interested in a few of the ideas you've expressed. Um, I like the levels of intimacy and, and these tools uh, and you, you went through that fairly quickly. I'd, I'd like to just to dig down and explore a couple of little things there. Uh, sure. uh, f first of all, when someone's online and they encounter the gospel online, uh, what are some of the typical reactions you've seen in the world of internet evangelism and, and uh, what are some of the steps that they go through? Like for instance, they might start by typing a query into Google, but what are some of the steps they go to and how, does, uh, how, how can we intersect them during the search? Okay. Well, some people, I think, um, intentionally go out and they type in a specific spiritual question. So, you know, they might sort of say, you know, how can I, um, how can I know God? Simple as that. I, I've had people write to me emails basically saying, how can I have, how can I be sure of eternal life? Yeah. Wonderful question to, to get asked. Uh, uh, I've had, you know, people ask me, um, how can I be sure that I have, that I'll go to heaven? So they're very obviously clear in their mind about what they're after and they've gone out with clear intent. And so obviously that's the ideal situation. Um, but we've also had situations where someone's got a very specific need. Maybe, maybe they've just had a loss in the family or they've, um, uh, you know, they've come to a crisis point in their life and they haven't really put together in their mind the fact that God is really going to help them through that, but they know they've got a need and they know it's probably going to be a spiritual need, but they haven't really got, you know, it's not really clear in their mind where they're at. So you kind of have to bring people at different points. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the things I like to, one of the, one of the diagrams I like to, to use to help understand this, um, and I'm sure that um, John will probably cover this in your other material. Uh, it's a little chart created by a guy called Frank Gray and he, he actually used to work for Far East Broadcasting Corporation which is a, a radio ministry and what he realized was that uh, it's, it's not so much that people um, suddenly jump into Christendom and become Christians but rather they're actually taking a long series of stepping stones and often sometimes beginning at uh, one corner of, of their of the universe which might be very far from God, like perhaps they're very negative towards God and they also don't know very much about God. So they're kind of, uh, at the other end of the spectrum there's people who who have learned a lot about God but haven't yet made those decisions and uh, hopefully what we're going to do is bring people to the other end of that spectrum where they uh, know lots about God but also they are very positive towards God, in fact they're even sharing their faith with others. So. Yeah. So we're kind of like bringing them on this little journey. Now, if you see it that way, then you realize that different websites or different media material or even different relationships that they build along the way are taking them on little stepping stones on that journey. And, and so 
Okay, so the first thing I want to understand when I connect with someone is where are they along, that, along those steps and therefore how can I best help them bridge the next little piece of that. Some, sometimes you can bring people fairly quickly from you know, a negative place to a fairly positive place and even make a commitment. But often that's the rarer case. You often need to go through a, a, a you know, more staggered you know, process that, that helps them you know, discover that. So I hope I answered your question there, John. I, I, yeah, yeah. Well, and yeah. You, you did it. And uh, one of the interests for me is is how we can design uh, solutions like way, way back in 94, 95 when I started in internet evangelism, I just did a uh, Roman Road presentation for spiritual laws kind of presentation and 12 little follow-up lessons that, you know, <laughs> that uh, they could immediately go to after they uh, prayed a sinner's prayer. And it was basically the title of the page was how to become a Christian. So when people type in how to become a Christian, it was one of the first pages out on the internet to do that. And so I would see uh, three, four, five people a day commit their life to Christ on this little straight HTML page. Now, things have have, have come a long way since then. Uh, and there's hundreds of thousands of people giving their lives to Christ online. Uh, and uh, so like how do you, how do you follow up someone after they've prayed that sinner's prayer and they click on, on a follow-up link what are some of the uh, technologies that you or campus crusade or global media outreach or these other groups deploy uh, how, how do you uh, take them along those along that journey that you're talking about with the gray matrix okay well um I can talk most about great global media because that's probably what I'm most familiar with, but um, I can speak a little bit about some of the other things. And and even global media is changing, so um, it's not a you know we're not stuck in the <laughs> the one one size fits all. But traditionally, what we've done is actually it's actually an old thing. It's it's been around for years. We've used it for radio ministries for years, and that is we write letters, we write emails in this case. So uh, usually, what happens? Someone uh, arrives at a website. Um, and they may have come there because they were directly seeking, uh, but I would also add sometimes they come there because we've used online advertising. So that's another whole space I'd love to talk a little bit more about. Uh, but um, and, and what's particularly interesting here is we actually use mobile phone uh, advertising as well as internet advertising. So that's so sometimes people weren't necessarily looking initially for God, but we kind of interrupt them in their journey and say, hey, have a look at this. <laughs> so it's kind of different. Okay, so so that when they first make contact, they often usually will see a, a gospel presentation. Sometimes it's text, sometimes it's video these days. Often that helps, uh, you know, explain a little better and connect with someone. Uh, and then there's an opportunity there for them to respond, and uh, and usually also an opportunity to fill out a little form to say um, I made a commitment or maybe a recommitment to Christ, or maybe I've got some questions, spiritual some questions. I, I don't understand something. I just got, like to get someone to clarify for me. And with that, they usually fill out their name and their email address. And we usually also can determine from their IP address uh, a little bit about where they've um, come from in the world. So you might kind of know the region of the world they're from. Uh, so that arrives then into a, a system which can route those emails to volunteers. Now, in the close of global media, they have around about 9,000 volunteers now. Um, in Australian team, which I'm sort of part of, we have about 250 volunteers at least. It's probably a little bit more now. And uh, and so basically, uh, each day we sort of uh, log into a system, um, and uh, that system will actually have us show some emails that we can respond to. Um, and you know, we're not necessarily uh, people aren't necessarily pushed on us, but rather we can sort of choose how many we can cope with that day. And, uh, and then from that, we write a little email. Now, sometimes when we write an email, we're often writing very similar sorts of things. So we have little templates that can help us uh, speed up the process. But uh, we always try to make parts of the email personal. So for example, we write a little personal prayer, or uh, maybe the introduction needs a special you know, personal element in, in it. So it's not just sort of rote things. We, we, we don't have little robots doing it. It's, it's something that we you know, make personal and particularly prayerful as we um, as respond to people. Now, what we're really trying to do in that process is a number of things. I, I try to try and surprise some a little bit with my love and concern for them. So I try to write in a, in a style that isn't just sending facts to the person, but is trying to express um, my compassion for them. Um, and uh, 
you know, that's kind of a, I guess, a, a skill to be learnt, but also a, a prayerful skill too. You know, it's come. Sometimes you just need a bit of godly inspiration. To say, How are you going to say this this way and make not not be condemning, but be encouraging yet, you know, um, steering someone, yet, um, you know, not not being, um, you know, not. Uh, no, not being abrupt in any way with them. And, you know, I, I had one guy who wrote back to me once and he, he told me he'd, uh, he'd drifted away, he actually lost his password to log into the system, finally found it, and actually he'd been spent some time in jail in the meantime, so he's really down, and he's had some very difficult struggles in his home, home life. And so I just felt that he needed a real word of encouragement so I wrote him a little email saying, it's a high five from Tony, <laughs> okay? And I just wanted to write him something that had some scriptures in it, but they weren't, they weren't in your face. Uh, they were just gentle, uh, but at the same time really uplifting, I hoped, to him that he would see that I was really deeply concerned for him, even though I barely knew him. But, but I felt that I wanted to express the love that I knew Christ would have for him, and I thought that was very important. So that's kind of one way... Um, uh, that we uh, that we would use that, and the other thing too is part of that we actually have a Bible study series. So in, in the case of Bible Media, we have a whole series of um, Bible studies up on GodLife.com. So we often, almost always, uh, write a little link to a Bible study series that can, someone can begin, and when they do, we can actually guide them through that and have some specific objectives that we want to work through through with them. Now, I think there's some, to be honest, I think there's some pluses and minuses with this approach. Um, it's, it's a great way. Oh, by, the one thing, by the way, one of the important things too about that process is we intentionally don't do it in, in an ordinary email box. It goes into a special system, and that's so that people are anonymous to each other. So we don't know the identity of the person we're communicating with, and they don't know ours. And that's kind of for everyone's safety and privacy. Uh, oh, and also we have accountability. That's very important. So uh, I actually have a team leader who can review the emails that I send. Um, and when I begin online, they usually sort of write a few comments and saying, "Oh, this is a, that's a good idea." And you, did you know about this too? Or, uh, but if they needed to correct me, they can, and that's important, so that I can't just um, abuse a relationship. For example, uh, I, I'm accountable to someone. That's that's crucial. And that's and as we actually develop new software tools, that's a key element in what we do. Uh, the other thing too is that um, uh, so, no, it's not a fire brigade. It's just the ice cream truck outside. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah. So the other thing that uh, I think we want to do there is uh, sometimes I find when I'm writing to someone who's actually on a mobile phone, they often just write back to me only a very short little message, and I feel like I want to write this much longer thing, and uh, and sometimes I feel the the relationship is a little lopsided. I, I, I feel that I'm not able to express things on an even keel. So um, something that I'm looking at doing and incorporating some of the tools we're looking, we're, we're building will be uh, to change that mix a little bit. And particularly one of the reasons I want to incorporate voice into what we do um, is so that people who uh, perhaps find it harder to, to write or they just got a mobile phone and they, they you know, it's very slow typing. Uh, they can actually use the voice of their phone uh, to to do recording, and so um, we think that actually will improve the process of of relationship building over time. Okay, now uh, that that is a a really great answer. I think the students are going to love that insight into the process of of how an internet evangelist operates and uh, and your heart and your passion for that. Uh, but you said something that intrigued me. You said you wanted to talk about the use of advertising, and part mm. of this course is is advertising, uh, analytics, conversion funnels, and that kind of thing. So, if you've got any thoughts on that direction, I'd uh, love to hear them. Okay. <laughs> well, um, not being exactly sure where God would take me, I, I um, uh, over the years since 2004, when I kind of kicked off all this, I, I decided I'd go and teach myself a lot about online advertising. So I spent about seven years just, just studying everything I could on this area. Uh, it's always changing, so I'm sure some of my knowledge is out of date. Uh, and I have actually applied some of this in partnership with the campus ministries here in Australia. Uh, we've actually run online surveys and seen some great results from that. So that's another whole outreach tool and technology um, which, which we developed a bit in Australia. Uh, but... Uh, 
but there are many different mediums. So another one we've actually done, I think at the start of last year, I ran a small Facebook uh, fan page system and I sort of researched what tools to use for that as another means to connect with university students. Let's bump the, yeah, just bump the uh, microphone there. Uh, so the uh, the whole area is actually it's actually quite a, a difficult area to really properly master. Uh, there's a lot of uh, people who are now advertising, and what I would never wish to see is uh, Christian ministries competing with each other with the Lord's money. Mm. Now, what I mean by that is, uh, when you go on in, in advertising in online, you're often um, bidding against keywords that people might search for. So when type of, people type in a something in a search engine like Google, you see some ads come up on the side. Well, the reason the ads come up there is because Google has, well, got two factors. First of all, they've, they've profiled you a little bit. They figure out what they know what you like from, from past visits. Uh, but also, they're looking at the keywords that you're typing. Uh, and from that, they try to match ad ads that will be of interest to you. Um, and so obviously, if you're searching for God, or, or typing phrases that would be related to that, then uh, there would be some advertisers who would promote in that space. So I kind of think it's it's a good thing that there aren't too many Christians trying to compete in that space. And um, uh, because otherwise I think what would end up happening is we just push the price up, <laughs> which is not going to help anyone. <laughs> and we are we going to reach any more? Oh, well, maybe not really. <laughs> so, um, so I think... Uh, the greater task really at the moment is uh, just getting enough people to do the follow-up work and uh, because we have you know thousands of people to follow up every day I said we have thousand nine thousand volunteers that isn't enough you know we could have you know, th another three or four thousand volunteers tomorrow and, and I would add with some of the new technologies that we're looking at, at engaging with I think they'll take more time and that's a good thing to build longer term relationships with people uh, and so consequently I suspect that over time we'll actually need more volunteers um, uh, if, if this approach proves, proves profitable. So, uh, so I kind of think that um, a better investment of our time and energy is really mastering and understanding how to do uh, online discipleship. Now, um, last year I actually went to a conference uh, in Bangkok, which actually was run by um, my ministry, Campus Crusade. And uh, in that, they had a gathering of basically internet ministry people. So, so just to give you a big, big picture, um, in Camps Crusade, it's, it's one of the world's largest missions. They have about, um, I think it's about 25,000 staff in, in uh, 149 countries. Um, and uh, basically, they divide their ministries into four major areas. One is um, student ministry, leadership ministry, church-led ministry, and now, very interestingly, virtual led ministry. So, so VLM or virtual led ministry for us has now become such a, a, an important component that we, we think of it as a major part of the whole mission. Now, uh, what that means is that um, there are more people sort of coming into this space. But what we're finding is that even though our ministry is extremely focused on discipleship, that's, you know, that's our bread and butter, our, you know, our, our, our um, a vision statement basically says, you know, we're, we're about uh, starting movements of people who will actually be multiplying the gospel of Christ uh, in, in accordance with 2 Timothy 2.2 um, principles. Um, yet we find it very difficult to do this online. Uh, and, and the key thing that's, I think, not occurring here is that deeper relationship building. A lot of our material has been built for face-to-face -face relationships. Um, but we're kind of still using this older technology, really, which is email, and, and that's good, but it, it has this downside in that I think it's not uh, addressing that, um, or as addressing as well that concern about how do we do this you know, longer-term relationship building and longer-term discipleship building, which in turn would result in a multiplication of, of the discipling process. So, so that's kind of why I've kind of shifted not just my ministry focus, but my technology focus as well, um, because um, I believe that's where God's taking us. Okay, and uh, so uh, you, you see there's a tremendous need for volunteers, a tremendous need for discipleship, a tremendous need for this face-to-face -face connection. Now, you say you've got 9,000 volunteers, and uh, in terms of the whole world, that's not a lot of volunteers. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, it's a lot for one organization, but uh, uh, 
why can't you have 90,000 volunteers? Why Do people volunteer and then drop away? Uh, what, what are some of the obstacles? What would make internet ministry more satisfying for the volunteer? That's, that's an excellent question, John, and certainly one I've given some thought to. Um, actually, when I was at the last conference, um, I, I was uh, we actually had little think tank groups who were just looking at new technologies and strategies and so on. And I was part of one group, or just appointed to one group, and, uh, and then someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, Tony, Tony, we've got a little job for you. Uh, and so, oh, okay, what is that? So they counted me off and they said, well, actually, what we'd like you to do is lead a virtual group. Uh, we've got, we'd like you to run, run one on Skype. And because uh, we've got some people who can't attend the conference. And the topic of our little group was actually just this area. It was actually how can we um, better care for our volunteers, who are people who are already volunteers, and how can we encourage more people to become volunteers. And uh, one of the people who was in my virtual group was um, Karen Shank, who heads up Truth Media. And uh, so she's really an expert in this area. Um, and so it was great to have her, her input. Um, and I think some of the things that uh, she's really established is um, sh she has an excellent training program for their volunteers that includes many tiers. So, for example, I mentioned we have accountability and coaching. Uh, they have almost like a career in <laughs> in their system where you can begin just by answering prayers for people. So people put in little prayer requests. You're not really writing to people who are evangelistically interested, you know, are not yet immediately interested in the gospel, but actually just put in a prayer note. And then you can pro progress to becoming a volunteer who does that sort of second level. And then you can also progress to becoming a person who teaches others, and then eventually someone who trains others, who trains others. So so they very much put into practice those discipling principles in their, in their mission. Uh, they also have online text chat, which I think is very effective. And uh, it's interesting that Global Media, just this year, if you look at, um, if you go and go and look at their website, greatcommission2020.com, they've actually just added a new uh, statistic in there, uh, which is looking at people that are connecting directly, and and that is usually via Facebook. Uh, so basically, they're st starting to move away from just having email to having this more direct uh, contact, and um, that's and kind of being identified as a key thing. Uh, give that website out again slowly. So me. yes, so Great Commission. C R E A T C O W M I S S I O N Great Commission two zero two zero dot com. Great Great Commission twenty twenty dot com. So if you visit there, you'll see you'll be quite amazed actually, because um, you'll see that the number of people who have responded every day, I mean really every single day, uh, to uh, to the, about a hundred websites that they have, and uh, that's just one ministry. You, you can go to another one. Uh, Go call, if you go to joyinheaven.com, uh, you can watch statistics, the people responding to the gospel in real time uh, from um, the other ministry, Jesus.net team. That's in Europe, based in Europe. So um, really exciting to see what God is doing every single day, uh, and you can be praying for those people as well. So, so, but what what's interesting is they've sort of you know, realised that this is a, an area they've got to, to grow in and um, deepen the relationships, as, as I mentioned. Okay, tell me three exciting stories that have sent you jumping up and down for joy in the last six months or so. Okay, uh, well, um, okay, well, one would be my you know, my new I, daytime IT job. Um, uh, I had a, I was actually at church one morning and a gentleman walked up to me at church and said, oh, um, you know, we run this IT company and it's only a very small little company. Uh, but we've got this product, uh, but we know it's a little bit old in style. We're hoping to make it mobile. So could you give us give us any advice? And I said, Oh, really? Just in that, I've been studying it a bit. And uh, so I uh, said, Look, I'm actually on flexible time. My other job, I'm a little bit bored there at the moment. How about if I just pop over for a couple of hours and I'll tell you, you know, the technology you need and the skill sets you need to hire and make sure you do this and watch out for that and that sort of thing. So they had a lovely time together and they were very interested. And uh, and then I um, um, uh, I just didn't think about it too much, and then I was just praying about it a little bit later, and thought, gee, you know, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be amazing if I took on that job? Maybe I should apply for that job because if I did, then I wouldn't be wasting my IT job time. I'd actually be using it as a training ground for ministry because I believe that's where I wanted to go longer term. 
And so I uh, applied for the job and went for a formal interview and they offered me the job. And uh, I'd also been putting off buying a computer for, for, for about a, a year, thinking, oh, do I buy an Apple or do I buy a Windows or I'm not sure what. Anyway, my new job, they bought, gave me a beautiful new computer, which I'm using right now, uh, uh, for my job. And they said, oh, so I said, can I use it in Christian ministry? Yeah, sure, no problem. Just take it home and that's no problem at all. So, um, so they did that. Uh, two weeks ago, they sent me on some, a week-long training course for, for mobile technology. So uh, I just believe that God was, uh, his hand was at once again confirming that that's where he wa wanted me to go. And it was a sort of affirmation. Uh, another door unlocking uh, for me. Uh, same thing had happened at the previous job. Um, I had, uh, I mentioned I went to a conference, I needed $3,000 to get there, didn't have the money, about to lose my job. Um, went, sorry, this is, you asked me the last period, but this is kind of related, so I'm bringing it up. Um, okay. uh, I, um, uh, I, I, I'd actually thought I was going to lose my job, wasn't sure if I was going to be unemployed for a period, uh, but saw, had a strong sense that God really wanted me at this conference. Uh, and, uh, and so I, um, uh, one Saturday I was talking to one of the parents and he said, oh, uh, have you tried this company uh, down the road? And I said, yeah, I actually applied to them, but they said they love to have me, but just don't have any places. Oh, you need a referral. Just a minute, I'll get on the phone. And uh, so Tuesday morning I had a job interview. Uh, Thursday morning, I, I uh, was praying and saying, Lord, I'm sure you want to be at that conference, but I can't see how I'm ever going to get there. I haven't got any money, and no one's you know, offered to, to fund me to get there. Two hours later, uh, they rang me up and said, oh, would you like that job we, we talked about on Tuesday? Yeah, I'd love to do that. It'd be great. Um, by the way, the new job is right next door to a Bible, Baptist Bible College, which is such another story. And uh, uh, then um, I... Uh, got home that night and I looked at their job offer and I saw, wow, these guys have, they'd give me a 10% salary rise. I didn't ask for that. Uh, and so I thought about it with my wife, Jenny, and uh, we prayed about it and thought, well, I think maybe, you know, the Lord's hands in that. I could actually take out a loan and uh, pay for this conference and, uh, and pay it off through the year. So I booked those flights and uh, um, booked my registration for the conference got back to my old job on Monday morning and the administrator called me over and said, oh, Tony, Tony, um, I think uh, the university can actually give you a four-week severance pay. <laughs> so they actually didn't give me four-week severance pay. They gave me six-week severance pay, wow. which paid for my conference and paid for a new laptop computer to go to the conference, <laughs> okay? which I used in ministry for four, the next four years. So. You know, God just said, oh, see, I've got it all sorted. You just, just watch just watch and see what's going to do. <laughs> so he's confirmed those little points along the way. And um, so I think this latest job was just another affirmation of that, that this is, um, this is where you really wanted me to be. And uh, uh, it's great encouragement uh, to me. Uh, you, you say that the Lord is leading you into the area of mobile and mobile ministry. Uh, what's so dynamic about mobile? Mm. Well, um, many things are happening uh, in mobile, but, uh, but first up is the fact that it's percentage-wise, a huge number of people in the world, as I mentioned earlier, 78% of the world have a mobile phone. In, in Africa, there's you know vast po populations of, of relatively unreached people who, who have uh, mobile technology. And uh, I was once chatting to a fellow who um, was telling me about uh, you know the little shepherds who have Back, back at the back of the sticks, and they, they, uh, they have barely a penny to their name, but their boss has given them a mobile phone so they can, if they have any trouble with the sheep, they can ring him up and you know get get sorted. Um, or if you travel to uh, places where you know people have camels and tents, you know usually poking out the top of the tent is a is a little satellite dish, and uh, you know they're, they're listening to, to um, information from all around the world. So it's, it's an amazing opportunity, um, I think. Uh, the other thing is, um, I think mobile technology potentially can be very personal too. Uh, it's a little private space uh, tool that, that people can use to, to communicate and build relationships. So, um, and for us, in terms of connecting with them, it's an opportunity to, to use um, advertising as well. And uh, so um, 
I can remember one particular country, I, I won't mention where, but just one particular place I remember reading, reading a report about is one of the regions of the world which is a little bit more difficult to reach and uh, somewhat dangerous to reach. And uh, in this particular place, they mentioned they did a report, a survey, and they found that uh, I think about 10% of the people there had been reached by missionaries, and about 20% by locals, and about 60% uh, in the church, small churches there had uh, been reached through uh, satellite radio or, or TV. And in that case, probably I would say the internet component of that would almost certainly have included mobile technology as well. So, um, uh, so I think there's uh, you know this huge potential there uh, if we can tap into that and uh, use it wisely. And uh, the uh, you're talking about discipleship now. On my latest and greatest mobile phone, I'm able to Skype with great efficiency. It seems to mm. I've got uh, uh, through the blessing of the Lord a nice Samsung uh, Galaxy 3S, which has got the most amazing camera I've ever used in my life. Uh, but it's also got really good Skype. And so do you think you can do one-to-one -one discipleship, mobile phone to mobile phone, face-to-face -face using Skype or Viber or things like that? Uh, certainly. In fact, we do. Um, in fact, we have a name for it. Uh, it's called, we call it Skypeship. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, first up, in Australia, we do it all the time. Uh, in the university ministry in Australia, we have... Uh, we don't have enough uh, full-time staff to go out to all the campuses. So um, an idea spawned originally in the US but now uh, is certainly used in our uh, teams in, in Australia is uh, we do distance discipleship. So we often connect with a new campus where we don't have anyone. Uh, we try and uh, connect with university students, typically people who are already Christians but sometimes not. Uh, but people who are I think very serious about their walk with God and uh, uh, they're committed to becoming what we call key volunteers. And so what we try and do is train them up to essentially be leading their own ministry on the campus, and we have no other staff there. Um, uh -huh. So, But we have actually back at uh, he our head office a, a full-time team whose full-time role is just to do distance discipleship with these people. And uh, we also send them out, so they actually do go, do go and meet these guys face-to-face, uh, uh, but they office, obviously might only see them maybe once or twice a year and uh, they also connect with us on camps and things like that that we run. So we make sure they get uh, good training and, and uh, they have sense of being part of a wider community. But, but certainly that's one way. Um, just this week um, I actually was chatting with a young man who had actually previously done some Bible college uh, but he was uh, going through a crisis in his life uh, he was feeling quite down and uh, he chatted with me on, on Facebook uh, and then he of his own initiative said look Tony I'd really like to chat with you on Skype because I'd really like to just you know be a little bit more personal so so we switched to, to Skype and I had a long chat with him and then we had another follow-up uh, conversation with him we booked a time to, to meet on Sunday um, so he's just gone through a little crisis moment where he needed some some support and although I'm not quite you know like a full-time mentoring role for this guy, I, I knew that he needed some uh, some encouragement from the scriptures, and you know, it's just like doing ordinary ministry anywhere else, uh, just like we're doing right now. Uh, uh, you you really can build good uh, uh, and solid relationships, and certainly you know, do fabulous Christian ministry using these modern tools. It's um, it, so know, so it's, so it's just, just normal. In, now. in reality, we get, end up with a blended approach, like. So, I often go to a conference and meet someone once a year or once every two years at a conference. But in between those conferences, we can have a lively relationship via electronic media, via Facebook, via Skype, uh, etc. And so, but the, the 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 times we do see each other face to face are very essential. So there's a blend between the uh, the face to face and the electronic, internet, mobile aspects uh, of the communication. Yes, definitely. And I would add too, sometimes it's in a one-on-one -on -one and sometimes it's in a group context as well. So, so we, um, and this is something we're hoping to develop in this new tool, but it, but it already exists in other, in other ways. Uh, so for example, we often have um, uh, Facebook groups or, or other groups like you know, Google Hangout groups or something that, that occur in other spaces. Um, uh, I do it in the secular world. 
just as much. In fact, uh, the training group I went to two weeks ago, uh, when I was there, I said, "Hey guys, let's let's kick off a Google Hangout for the Australia Australian region for this new mobile technology." So I sort of kicked off a new group, and the guys at the front said, "Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that." So so that's a kind of way which we can continue the relationships that we built there. Um, and also, sometimes it's a way of just keeping up to date with things, but but it can be much more than that. Sometimes we can, um, uh, um, you know, connect with someone that 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 is in specific spiritual need, and that's exactly what happened to me just over the weekend with someone whom I I've actually never met face to face ever, but um, yet we are able to talk at quite a deep level, um, and and in a sense, and here's the other key element. We often find this with with, the, with writing emails as well, be, because we are uh, anonymous or more distant. That can actually be um, a, a valuable thing in helping someone feel comfortable about opening up and dealing with something that's quite personal. So, someone whom they did know, you know, face to face during the day, they might not feel so comfortable uh, opening up about this. Various different people, but you know, th there's a real. Uh, niche there in a sense of being able to minister to people who just need that little piece of distance. So so a key reason why I am actually developing a new tool and not just, just reusing what's out there, although we actually will integrate with Skype and other tools too, um, uh, was this key re requirement of anonymity that we mm -hmm. wanted to allow people to preserve that in anonymity both ways. And a lot of the existing tools don't do that. They often you know, show your email address and full name and things or photo. Uh, and we we want to allow people to not have to do that, um, so that they can, um, you know, work through things that are, that are private. Okay, what is the new tool again? Oh, we haven't actually got a name for it <laughs> yet. <laughs> I hope I'll get a good name. <laughs> um, and I'm still look. I, I've just spent today. Um, uh, a lot, well, I've actually spent about a, a couple of months already just researching technology for it, and uh, we're sort of identifying the content aspects of it and the. Sort of technology pieces, and today I've just been looking very specifically at uh, how the online chat part of it will work, and I want to make sure that that's going to have the, the technology to be stable and secure and and um, uh, hacker-proof, we hope, and, and all those good things, um, but at the same time retain anonymity. So, so um, that's you know, that, hey, that's why God gave me skills and gifts, uh -huh. so I can go and figure that stuff out. Yeah, so, and with a lot of these things based on Java and Java apparently compromised uh, recently, it, it makes you sort of you think, okay, this is standard, it's in everything, and now it gets compromised. It, it shakes oh. your confidence that any system okay. can be hacker-proof. Sure. Uh, well, let me clarify that. First of all, it's not Java. Um, uh, uh, J Java is actually run by Oracle, but but the web is generally built on something called JavaScript, which is quite a different yeah. language. Yes. Uh, uh, so that's perhaps, perhaps what you're referring to. Um, no, I was talking about the, the Oracle thing in Java. Oh, oh yes, yeah. Oracle's not done a great job with uh, looking after uh, as being a custodian of the Java language. All right. uh, it's it's uh, it's has um, basically what they're not doing is not putting enough resources at it to keep it maintained quickly enough. Mm -hmm. And so when we find security holes, it's often become a problem. And particularly because it has historically been deployed inside browsers, uh, mm -hmm. that's a major security concern. And so, actually, I've just turned off Java in my browser. I don't, I don't let it run anymore because it's t too much of a security concern. But for the apps I'm actually writing, I'm not even using Java. I've, uh -huh. uh, I've, um, uh, I've done uh, uh, because I work in IT research, and because I'm a crazy geek who loves <laughs> learning new things, I'm, I've clocked up nearly 60 computer languages wow. now, uh, which is crazy. <laughs> uh, but for this project, I've just learnt uh, Node.js, which is a new emerging. Uh, server-side technology uh, based on JavaScript, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I'm actually learning a new um, mobile technology uh, kit, which actually I've been studying for some time, but uh, now done some more formal study in it, um, and uh, and so that that I'll I'll put those two together. So basically, we'll have Java both ends, um, but then I'm also looking at third-party processes and um, uh, you know, sort of we have to look at how it's going to scale, particularly, um, but uh, not cost us too much at the beginning. So, um, as we have to look, have to look at not just how to um, 
uh, not just the technologies involved, but ha but even how we'll fund it and how the costing will function and so on. So it's quite it's quite a tricky puzzle. And then how we how we do promotion and how, what we're hoping to do basically is work in partnership with existing groups and um, and offer this as an option for follow up. So so it becomes a, a tool that they can make use of if they want to. Okay, so you're so just uh, winding up now. Uh, uh, the uh, so you, you're uh, someone who's actually at the nitty gritty end of building the follow up tools, and you've been in evangelism for uh, what since uh, I won't say how long, but approaching forty years, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, uh, so uh, it's been a fascinating journey for you, and the Lord's led you from you know Leighton Ford Crusades all the way through. Uh, to, to putting together uh, follow-up tools for sophisticated modern uh, mobile browsers. So uh, that's an amazing journey in God's work. There's a very few people would have had such a journey. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very exciting. <laughs> I, feel, I feel very privileged by the Lord to, to, to be embarking on this next part. So we, we never sure, it's an experiment, you know, we're kind of never sure where, where it's going to go, but, but we do believe God's giving his confirmation on it. No, is that, it just seems, yeah. to, it seems to, and so that, therefore we know that we're doing the right thing, uh, even if it's just going to be a learning exercise, and we discover what doesn't work. <laughs> it's possible. So, uh, but still, I think that it, I think it probably will, and I think that uh, if we are listening to His voice, um, uh, as a technologist, the temptation is to feel like you can fix everything yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but actually, um, a secret is not to, but actually to ask God for that wisdom each day and thank him for when you see an insight and uh, and I think that's for me is having sort of kind of worked in the industry for so long I have to unlearn those things and make sure I'm putting putting um, him first as I solve technology puzzles you know, it's like it's like solving maths but asking God for the insight to solve the maths you know, it's sort of different well I, I uh, just to tell an amusing story when I was uh going through the Baptist Theological College, which was now Malin College, which is near your work or near your old work. Uh, uh, I was uh, also uh, pastoring a church that grew from 150 to 400 and simultaneously doing another degree here from the Melbourne College of Divinity. And there was these subjects that were really, really boring and that I didn't bother studying. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so, uh, lo and behold, <laughs> uh, one being Jewish history. So I went came before the Jewish history exam. I said, oh, "Lord, do you, do you mind giving me the exam answers to the exam tomorrow? I've got to pass the subject." And he did. And I got, oh, uh, I got eighty-five percent in the exam. I had no clue what I was writing on the paper. <laughs> that, was just oh, well. that was the sheer mercy of the Lord, uh, <laughs> because he, he knew I was overloaded and I couldn't possibly. Uh, do all this medieval history of the pogroms, etc. It just didn't sit in my brain. There's no way I was ever going to memorise it. So uh, I'm sure it's it's very interesting to some Jewish historians. So I, I have a blank in my knowledge there now, but I passed the exam. <laughs> I have another, another quick story about Manion College. Yeah. I, I, I was next to it for four years, right? Yep. Uh, when I first visited there, I went to the principal and said, could I get a speak to, chance to speak to the students? And he more or less said, oh, look, you know, there's lots of people who come and ask that tonight. I'm not sure if I'll find a space. And maybe you can speak for a couple of minutes somewhere, you know. So I thought, mm, okay. Um, anyway, uh, recently I had a chance to speak at another Baptist college, a Baptist church. Uh, and the pastor said, I said, I thought I might get 10 minutes. And I, he said, can you take a sermon? I said, oh, I guess I'd probably, yeah. And, uh, and then he said, could you take three? <laughs> <laughs> so I got to got to preach to a thousand people for a day, wow. which is amazing. Um, and his son, uh, the son of this part, senior pastor, is one of the lecturers at the college. Yep. And so he was keen to come for me to come out and talk to his students on because he's actually speaking in, in evangelism. And he said, "Look, I really must get the principal to get you to come and talk to the students and staff, staff, all the staff and students." So on the very last week of my work at Transmax was the, the week when I was actually had a chance to speak to the principal and the students about internet evangelism, finally. Yes. Now, here's the extra little ice cream on the cake. I got an interesting little email from the principal of the college only a few weeks back, about a month ago, and he said, you know, I was thinking over Christmas that I don't get a lot of opportunities to share my faith, and I was wondering what I could do to assist you in internet evangelism. Wow. So that, wow. that was that was, was that my <laughs> friend John Sweetman? Yes. <laughs> He, he was my youth pastor when I <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so uh, he, he had to put up with me when I was very raw and young and I think he showed great grace. Uh, well, he's a great, he's a, he's a wonderful man, very gifted guy. He'd be perfect at doing this stuff. Yeah. He's just, just such a gifted guy for communicating. And, and a maths major, so. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, Tony. Uh, this has been great. I'll, I'll end the broadcast uh, by clicking the end broadcast, but we'll just chat for a minute after that. Sure. Okay.